If you have a smart speaker, you have access to the entire world of NPR and St. Louis Public Radio. All the latest news and all the captivating stories. Activate our voices with yours by telling your smart speaker to play St. Louis Public Radio. Missouri's primary season is finally over after the do-over election in the 78th District House seat. And Bruce Franks has emerged very victorious over State Representative Penny Hubbard. The St. Louis Democrat joins us next to talk about his resounding victory on another edition of Politically Speaking. Nine, eight, eight seven, six, six five, five four, three, two, one. Uh, I think that is fair yes, to I say. I say hands to kiss and babies to shake. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I think my record speaks for itself. That's a really good question. If we're going to get anything done, we're going to have to find those who we can work with, but only for the people, not invested interests, not political relationships, not padding our pockets, but for the people. That's Bruce Franks after he declared victory over State Representative Penny Hubbard last Friday. Hello and welcome to the Politically Speaking podcast. I'm your host, Jason Rosenbaum. Joining me in studio today is... Colleague Joe Manis. My special guest host because she did basically <laughs> most of the work in this contest. Rachel Lippman. And our very special guest, a person that fought very, very, very hard to be on this show, we uh, have as our special guest. Bruce Franks, uh, state representative elect. If you win against Eric yeah, Shellquist. From but, the 78th district. But I think the chances of that are extremely high. Yeah. So welcome to the show. Uh, and, thanks for having me. And, uh, well, thanks for being being here so soon after your victory yeah i just gotta ask have you have you gotten a chance to decompress at all or has no. it been no none no no chance it's at been all. nonstop. i'm still mentoring and doing a lot of the things that i was doing beforehand already so yeah so before we get into a this this crazy race that you just won by a landslide and b what you plan to do in jefferson city mm-hmm. for people that haven't been paying attention want to know a little bit more about you and kind of about what you got you interested in activism, politics, maybe even you talk about your secrets to being such a great battle rapper as well. <laughs> I, I have to say, before the show aired, which I had not really done before this primary and special election, I actually watched a battle rap between you and, and somebody else. It was intense, very intense. Very intense. So, well, in fact, in fact, uh, uh, a the press guy for a statewide candidate who I was talking to on some totally unrelated brought this up, said he real he said he is really excited about the possibility of you doing a battle rap on the floor <laughs> of the house. So before we get to that, tell us a little bit about yourself. Um well I am from South St. Louis, um Gibson and Tower Grove area before it was the Grove. Um uh nineteen ninety one my brother Christopher Harris was killed. Um he was used as a human shield. Um on Gibson, uh, June 7th. That started a long line of um, gun violence and and deaths, you know, just in my life. Um, I graduated from Lindbergh High School, uh, went to college at Florissant Valley, ran track, um, got out of there, and had my first daughter. And so that was it. It was time to get in the working world. So um, I worked. Um, and then eventually I got married and, um, had two businesses that we own, um, that we run both in South city. Um, and then my ground happened Mm -hmm. and, um, that was, that was kind of my wake up call. It was a wake up call. I think for everybody living Mm -hmm. in St. Louis. Yeah. Even, even if you thought you were conscious before that, um, Mike Brown is what kind of really shook you up. Um, now, when you say a wake-up call, in your case, how did you see that? I mean, what what did it, what sort of emotions did it bring up so, in you? So I've always been a protector and a fighter. Um, I've always, you know, survived, especially coming from rough neighborhoods, you know. Um, I was always willing to die for my family, you know, and my close friends, Um Mike Brown taught me that I was willing to die for what I believe in. And what I believed in was racial equality. What I believed in um, was fighting against social injustices across the board. Um, And that included sometimes um, fighting and and maybe dying for people that you don't really know. Um, And so I think 
Mike Brown bought, the death of Mike Brown bought a lot of strength. Um, showed people the strength that they had in them all along. Um, showed people the fight um, and the activism that they actually had in them. We just didn't know the first thing about truly being um, a, a textbook or a Webster de definition of uh, what an activist is. You know, so we, we kind of had to figure it out. And so what what do you think has been for you, um, what do you, you tout as being sort of the greatest achievement of the movement that you got into? What do you think has changed from the work, the activist work that you've done and the mentoring work that you've done? And what really hasn't changed? I mean, what still needs to be done? Well, what hasn't changed is the fact that um, young men and women that look like me are still dying at the hands of the police. Um, it happened the day that you were elected in Tulsa. Yeah. Oh. I'm sure that has caused everybody to think, especially you. Wouldn't uh, you say so? Yeah, because I was so, um, I was just so wrapped up in everything else after the election. Um, you know, running and doing interviews and making sure I still talk to everybody and making sure I mentor. Um, then I finally saw the video yesterday after uh one of my campaign guys, Dan, texted me, say, kept saying, check out Tulsa, check out Tulsa. And I'm like, Tulsa? And I saw the video. And to to hear the narrative that was being painted, you know, by the officers in the helicopter, um, and to see what actually happened, and to show you um, how how stories differ a lot of times from what people may say happened, um, as opposed to when videos came out, just like, um, i.e., uh, Jason Stockley. Um, so I think I think the thing that's happening and, and continues to happen is the fact that we're still being killed um, at the hands of those who are supposed to be protecting us. Um, crazy enough and ironically, um, I think the thing that I've worked on that outside of the youth and mentoring the youth, which is first and foremost um, to me, um, is the police community relationship. I was just going to yeah. say, because yeah. I think that there has been this binary argument, especially in Missouri since Michael Brown's death, that you either have to support the police or you have to support what the protesters in the street have to say. And you have proven that it doesn't have to be that choice. You can be supportive of law enforcement, but also want change. I wanted, you, I wanted you to talk about that and also to talk about how you're going to bring that mentality to a legislature that has been making a lot of those binary choices for the last two years. Absolutely. So um, I can walk into the police station right on 20th and Olive, and it's only two reasons I could be walking in here. I can walk in here because we are working on minority recruitment and trying to make sure our police department directly reflects the community in which they police. Um, I could be walking in here um, just to talk about community engagement, um, a teen summit where we're going to bring together youth and law enforcement to have a real conversation. Or I could be walking in here and talking about how I feel about a police involved shooting. I could be walking in, in, in into the police department to talk about um, some of the discrepancies and misconduct um, that has been going on with certain officers and, and discrepancies with our black officers. Um, so you can absolutely um, support good police. Um, there's a such thing. Now they may be far and few between, you know, few and, you know, far in between because coming from where we come from. Um, we see the same officers in the same district. So if these officers in our district are the same bad apples that we see, of course we're going to think that all police officers are bad because these are the only ones that we see. So until I'm able to bring in um, Lieutenant Perry Johnson or Sergeant Heather Taylor or Sergeant Ty Ross or Sergeant William Clinton or any of these people to um, to actually have real conversations with the people and these are the people that actually stand up on the force, you know, um, we have a we have a lot of them, Lieutenant Kim Allen, Lieutenant uh, Latricia Allen. Like these are all people who we can count on to be that voice for not only um, the department, but as well as the community. So it's my job to it's my job to bring them to the community um, and integrate them as you know, in different parts of the community where 
um, they just may not be privy to. Now, <clears throat> in Jefferson City, um, over the last couple of years, there's been pressure to do pass some laws in reaction to uh, the Michael Brown shooting, and then there's been pressure against doing much. Um, if you get to Jeff City, assuming you win in November and you're in sworn in in January, are there particular bills that you really are going to try to get the General Assembly to listen to? And B, since Democrats are in such a minority in Jeff City, how are you going to get your um, objectives passed in the House? So I'll start backwards. I'll start with the question you asked second. Okay. Um, I am the protester that built the relationship with the police and the circuit attorney's office. Um, I, I work across the board really well. And I've learned that sitting down with those and trying to understand the other side, even though I may not agree, even though after the conversation I still might not agree, um, but it's about sitting at the table and working with those who we don't agree with so we can get to some type of effective change because um, one thing that we all have in common in Jeff City is we're only accountable to the people, no matter if you're Republican or Democrat. Um, so I think my lived experiences um, will be brought to the table, and that's something that will be um, an eye-opener. Um, and it will will be able to influence some change um, and truly and truly make a difference in Jeff City. A lot of people say, "Oh, don't go in there thinking, you know, you're gonna change change the world um, in two days." But why not? You know, why not go in with the optimism? Because that's that's just how it has to go. I I can't take I can't take what um, what usually happens and, and just be okay with that as my normal. Um, as far as specific bills. Um, there are a few bills, um, that I've paid attention to heavily. Um, it's been kind of hard while campaigning. And, uh, that's understandable. But, <laughs> um, body cameras. Now, body cameras are important, but, um, I had a conversation with Jamila Nasheed yesterday. Oh. And. We'll get to that in a minute, but continue. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I had a conversation with Jamila and the sheet yesterday and we talked to, you know, she asked me how I feel about body cameras. And I said, yeah, of course, um, it's, it's about accountability. But we have to make sure that um, our special ops officers and our SWAT officers, um, you know, uh, mobile reserve officers are wearing body cameras. Because if we look at the police involved shootings um, in the past three years, Jason Flannery, was mobile reserve, even though he was off duty. Um, he was the person who shot, shot and killed Von Derrick Myers. Yeah. Um, so was Isaac Holmes shot by mobile reserve officers. So was Mansoor Ball Bay shot by special ops officers. Um, so we have these these issues with you know, I guess this particular department. We need to make sure that we have cameras on them as well. And another thing is. When an officer is working, and this is just my personal opinion, but when an officer's working secondary, they have the same duties as a police officer. They're binded by law just like they would be if so they So, like, were. if they're working private security for somebody. Exactly. That's what, what you're talking about. Continue. Uh -huh. it's Which the same. is how the Von Der Meyer shooting exactly. happened in, in Shaw. Exactly. So you 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 have the same power you have as a, as a police officer, so we should have the same checks and balances um, as well you know, if if that's the case. So we'll get back into legislative priorities in a minute, but I do want to shift to the political battle that you just waged that I tweeted <laughs> out, is this a new era in St. Louis politics? I'm sure you're going to say yes, but <laughs> let's give a little bit of a backdrop to our listeners before we get into the specifics. So you filed to run against uh, State Representative Penny Hubbard, who was seeking her fourth term in the Missouri legislature. This was actually her third time running in the 78th district, which was much different from the district she ran in in 2010. This is why that's important. Mm -hmm. I checked the numbers in 2012 when uh, Penny Hubbard ran against Ruth Arisman and Sam Cummings. She did very well in the fifth ward where she lives and is where the power base is, but she did not do very well in the seventh ward, the ninth ward, or the 20th ward. She won the third ward, which is close to the fifth ward. So I didn't realize this when I was interviewing you back in July, but you were like the perfect candidate to run against her because you're from the ninth ward where she's the weakest, basically. 
and um, she her her main power center is in the fifth ward and not the rest of this district that they haven't spent a lot of time cultivating. And was that kind of your thought as well when you got into this? Did you do you look at it that grandly, or were you thinking about it more broadly? Basically, so we were looking at numbers. Uh, we knew where we were strong at, and we knew where we were weak at. Um, but I knew that although I grew up on the south side, I still lived in a Cochran when I was younger as well. This is where I played basketball, baseball, football. Um, so a lot of the families that are in Clinton Peabody, a lot of the families that are in Carr Square and the Cochran a Preservation Place, we grew up together. Um, and so when people started to hear that um, I was running, um, you know, I, I started to I started to kind of penetrate the Fifth Ward, um, and I knew in the ninth, I knew in the ninth we would be good. Um, the twentieth, especially Graboy Park um, community that I worked in, I lived in as a kid. Um, the seventh, initially, I'm gonna tell you the truth, mm-hmm. um, and I love the seventh. I love Soulard. I love every part of the seventh. Um, I love my entire district, but I fell in love with Soulard campaigning down there. Um, and the more and more I went down there, it's like the support just grew and grew and grew. Soulard's a great place. Su- yeah. No, Soulard's. I love Soulard. Soulard's and, and amazing. I, and, I, and before Rachel jumps in, I think there was another key element that was different from Ruth Arisman or Natalie Vall. And I, I know this. I got to get the I got to get this out of the way. You're an African-American candidate in a district that's 65 percent African-American. Those other two people I mentioned, while they were fine candidates, were white. And it's very difficult for a white person to win in an African-American district. And you were from a population center in South City, which is growing increasingly African-American. So that that had to be another reason you were different from the other people. Way to steal all my thunder, Jason. Um, That's exactly what I was going to bring up is that a lot of the wards, especially the ninth, look a lot different than they did in uh, going back to 13, which is when you would have had the aldermanic elections there. But they've obviously changed then the demographics of the um, the districts that include them as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Yeah, I think. um... And I'll I'll just be, I'll be truthful. Um, A lot of people told me when I, you know, watch out for the Hubbards. Mm -hmm. You know, I heard, um, you know, stories, whether they were true or false, um, about tactics and things that they did. And they always told me, watch my back. And I always told people that, you know, not trying to be, you know, extra tough or anything else, but I'm, I'm different. You know, like Hubbard's got a big family. Well, I got a big family too. Um, and just the just the the atmosphere. Um, I come from the same neighborhoods. We might not come from the same exact neighborhoods, but we come from the same conditions. Mm-hmm. We come from the same disenfranchised community. Yeah, I mean, in St. Louis, and this goes back decades. Um, St. Louis politics has often been a family business, where yeah. you have different families who have risen. To political power and, and fight amongst relative, themselves fight for among the power. And, I'm yeah. thinking the Carters, the mm-hmm. Clays, uh, the Villas, mm-hmm. the Conways, the Conways, um, mm-hmm. the Slays, yeah, various relatives, the Leisures. Yeah. I mean, some are no longer in politics now, but but I, back I, in the day, my 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 point being is that the Hubbards were just the latest in what's been a tradition mm-hmm. going back in St. Louis, probably fifty or sixty years. Yeah, but it's always interesting when in an election like yours the dynamics then begin to change because the family whatever family it is loses a major election i, I want to point this out before you respond because this hasn't been talked about a lot because you know the the the, the candidates in this race are on different sides than yours but two years ago there was another instance where a political dynasty lost to a young upstart that was joshua peters, peters. defeating Chris Carter Sr. Now, I'm well aware Joshua Peters is a Lacey Clay ally, and you're not, as we're going to get to. <laughs> but I think that was in – well, I, and I would not say that your race and that race were exactly the same. But that – you could you could argue that – Chris Carter III told me this directly, that sometimes being in a family dynasty has its negatives. If and that's you have the a, alderman. That's the alderman. The alderman. And that is, if you have a long track record, you make enemies. And I think that's what happened with the the Hubbard situation, too. That's kind of my sense. I don't know what your sense is, but I'd be interested in your take on on that part. And just for our listeners, I just want them to know, in case they hear any noises, we have now been joined by Bruce Frank's kids, King Frank's and Brooke Frank's. So if you hear a little bit of noise, 
that's why, but uh, we want them to be as comfortable this as This is possible. the rest of the Franks family dynasty that we're <laughs> building. <laughs> and his name is King Franks. Yes. yes. So if dynasties are doing what they're supposed to do, if no matter who it is, um, if they are actually uh, doing the job of the people, then, you know, it's quite okay. I don't care how many uh, Hubbards, Carters, Slays, Clays, whoever run, you know, if you're doing a job with the people. And I think all too often, um, you know, and I'm cool with some of the, you know, a couple of those, but all too often it becomes a family business. Um, and so that wasn't, I wasn't really worried about it because I knew how different our campaigns would be. I knew uh, we would concentrate on the people and involve the people. Um, and, and, you know, that's that's what was needed. After August 2nd, you were down by 90 votes. And I started hearing reports about how there was absentee ballot irregularities because there had been talk about that before the primary. Dave Rowland and I had talked on the phone about it. Mm -hmm. In my, my overview of your race, I had mentioned the, the the request for the Board of Elections to look at the absentee ballots, but they rejected that. Mm -hmm. And I knew that there were the Hubbards had large amounts of absentee votes when they ran in elections. But one of the reasons I was a little skeptical that there was absentee ballot fraud is they have made so many enemies over the years, and none of these people have taken any evidence to federal prosecutors, the Board of Elections, they didn't challenge them like you challenged them. And obviously, the Post-Dispatch wrote a pretty long expose on the irregularities. From what you've heard, did you get any sense of why, you know, a Ruth Arisman or a Robin Wright Jones or a Natalie Vall or any of the people that ran against the Hubbards before didn't do what you do and challenge the Hubbards in court? I'll tell you the truth. I think it's because um, Natalie Natalie had, you know, Natalie tried to, to get some stuff together, and she worked hard. Um, I learned a lot from Natalie, to mm -hmm. tell you the truth. Um, but we go back into the factor of our race and our actual race. Um, I'm black. So going into disenfranchised communities and talking to um talking to these people who, you know, um, who've been disenfranchised and who've been miseducated and misled about this process um, was easier. And it wasn't a going in intimidating or, you know, um, it was simply them reaching out to me. You know, they were comfortable enough to reach out to me. And um, after talking to them and then after sending um, a few people from the team to get their affidavits, uh, you know, they were reporting that, oh, they got white guys down here in Clinton Peabody uh, intimidating people. I had two of the, the most laid back people, uh, you know, just going down there and basically um, getting the affidavits, you know, getting the affidavits uh, and the stories on actual paper. These are stories that I already know. I had already talked to, you know, these individuals, you know. So that's what, that's what, um, I guess that's the difference in that yeah. situation. So at this point, uh, do you see your victory as something that is really going to change the dynamics of politics in the city? Or is this just the first of what you think needs to be done to change the direction? Of because for politics? our listeners that didn't know, you won the special election by over 50 percentage points, just just so our listeners should know. But continue. So I think I think our rate, I think hand in hand both. So I think this is a stepping stone to something a lot bigger. Um, but what one thing I do, um, I know that's happening is now a lot of our establishment and a lot of the entrenched politicians um, understand what happens when you get some grassroots organizing and some activism and, and you get the people involved. Um, there's nothing you can do. Um, Michael Mex had a speech, the ballot of the bullet. And in that speech, he talked about how important our vote was and how much power we had in the vote. You know, without us, without the people, um, that's the only reason these elected officials are in office. You know, so without them, you know, without the vote, you know, we have the power to put in and we have the power to take out as the people. 
Um, and so I think it is a first step, but I think what, what we did as a community and what we did as a city, um, I think that set the mold for something way bigger. Now, you know, obviously William Lacey Clay, the <laughs> congressman, went on a huge limb for Penny Hubbard. Yeah. And, and uh, what did you think of that before I get to my next person that didn't go out on a limb for Penny Hubbard? So um, I thought it was ridiculous. Um, the fact that our congressman went through such great lengths to um, discredit uh, what people in the community, his actual constituents, had went through simply to save a friend, simply to be loyal to corruption, uh, was an extreme issue with me. And I don't care if you the congressman, I don't care if you're the president. At the end of the day, um, when you're not for the people and when you blatantly show that you're not for the people, that's an issue. When you write a when you write a letter to Loretta Lynch, um, asking to intervene into our special election um, because of violation of the Voters Act, right? And Voting Rights Act. Voting Rights yes. Act, and, and, and a, you know a couple other things that he put in there. But you bring it all back around to say, I worked with Miss Hubbard to bring the NGA here. The NGA had nothing to do with me running for state rep. It had nothing to do with the absentee process mm -hmm. that was being abused. Yeah. You know, but we see where your invested interest is. And that's the that's the biggest issue with that's the biggest issue with Lacey even going out on a limb in this race because Sack, the people Sack. the people are the ones that were disenfranchised and he didn't care about those affidavits that was put in the same letter addressed to Loretta Lynch that I wrote after which his you did, letter. Which I got an email. For Congressman Clay, this is a rare case where he lost when he got involved in a local election. Now, his predecessors um, or in other districts in the region, generally when they get involved in a local election, they usually only do it when they're pretty sure they're going to win. The fact that he lost, in effect, by backing the loser, what do you think that does to his clout? And what does that do as far as your clout when you go to Jeff City? And just to add on to that question, Maria Chappelle Nadal backed you early on, and she backed a couple of people in 2014 that lost. What do you think it does for her that she supported you? So I think that what it does to um, Lacey Clay, it shows, for one, it shows the community um, where his values lie. And we've seen that publicly now. Um, what it does in maybe Jeff City is show how much power um, he feels that he has that he might not have. And I'm not saying that power transfers to me. The power transfers to the people. Mm -hmm. It transfers to the community. So they know if you want the power, the way to get the power is to put the power into the people and show the people how much power they actually have. Mm -hmm. And same way with Maria. She hey. lost some races. Um, she won this race. Um, you know, it's it's hard to say. Yeah. It's hard to say um, in, in Maria's case, but when it comes to Lacey Clay, I think um, he's doing a good job of uh, showing people who he is, so it's time we believe him. Two, two more questions. What did you think of the fact that Mayor Francis Slay, who has been a Hubbard ally for many years, didn't say very much in this race? Um, I was happy that... I was happy that he stayed out of the race. Um, you know, I asked a lot of people to stay out of the race. And I wanted to be a good old-fashioned, fair fight in the middle of the street. No extra family members, no extra <laughs> weapons. <laughs> you know, just, just us. Um, and the fact that he stayed out of the race, um, a lot of people were don't understand um, why he stayed out of the race. I don't know why he stayed out of the race, but one thing I can tell you is that um, I am lead mentor in every program that's within the peer plan, mm -hmm. um, prevention, intervention, mm -hmm. um, reentry, and enforcement. It's the mayor's sort of big crime-fighting plan. Yeah, absolutely. So um, youth build and prison of prosperity and civil liberties, these are all programs that are within there. So I mentor within these programs. I'm the civil rights liaison for these programs. Um, I work 24 hours um, for these programs because the youth are involved. 
um, and it's it's crime prevention from the root cause. So, and these are programs that are are best practices. These are programs that are you know nationally recognized, um, and so you know we have a working relationship. Um, and so I don't know if that was part of it, or I, I don't know if he was just you know if he was just tired. So. Yeah. I wanted to, to kind of circle back quickly to um, the, the name that piqued Jason's attention earlier in this podcast, which was that you'd sat down and had a conversation with Jamila Nasheed. Um, what do you think the relationship's going to be like working with her and Maria and with, you know, the rest of the delegation in, yeah. in Jefferson because, City? Because there is some context of why I perked up, because I saw her tweet basically saying, could he be the biggest disappointment in Jefferson City? He, he was clearly referring to you and just... To give a slight more context, you know, the Hubbard family and Jamila and Nasheed have been very close personally for a long time. Also, a hey, how's it going? <laughs> uh, his uh, King, King I, I, I'm bringing King uh, Franks up with me into the podcast right now. Is yeah. this okay? Hey. And um, you know, what did you make? What did you make of that? What did you make of the fact that she reached out to you, or did you reach out to her? And I'd like to, I'd be interested to hear what the relationship is going to be like. So she reached out to me. Um, and, you know, basically just said, uh, you know, let's meet up. Let's meet up for lunch. I say, fine. You know, I'll sit down and talk to anybody. Um, Jamila is a person who um, I didn't know personally before all of this. Um, I heard some things. I heard good. I heard bad. But one thing that I did know about Jamila um, when it comes to the community, when it comes to disenfranchised communities, um, Jamila fights hard for black folks. You know, and that resonated well with me. I didn't know her. Um, I actually, uh, Dr. Prince um, of Slate actually invited her to Prison of Prosperity, and she came in and talked, and I introduced her. Um, and, you know, she did amazing with, you know, with our young men in, in, in MSI. Um, but I didn't know her. Um, and after learning about her and researching some things, yeah, of course there are things I don't agree with. Um, but... You know, I was willing to sit down. She was willing to reach out. Um, and we had a good conversation. And I think we understand a lot about each other now. Um, you know, and she's, you know, anybody that knows her knows she's a strong-minded person. I'm a strong-minded person. Um, you know, there was some advice that was given. Um, but I, you know, I just, I just basically let her know the reason why I'm doing this. You know, because people won't know until they truly ask you and sit down and talk to you. And I, you know, I basically let her know I'm accountable to the people. Like this is, this is strictly about the people. This is the people's seat. You know, the 78 district seat doesn't belong to me. And one of the one of the things that that Jamila said at a NARAL event, um, she said that the one of the greatest things about democracy is the fact that when you have elections, the people can vote in who they want and vote out. You know, who they don't want. And these seats don't belong to anybody. You know, they belong to the people. And that's something that set well with me. Um, Because she comes from, I mean, her back, if you talk about her with, about her background, she had a really rough background. Mm -hmm. And just like you have a really unusual path to Jefferson City, you could say the same thing about her. Absolutely. I think that she's taken a bit more pragmatic uh-huh. view of, of of how to approach Jefferson City. She's voted with Republicans on things just like Penny Hubbard has. Right. But right. I think she's done it a little bit less. And she also knows when to fight for basic democratic values, which is my, maybe why she got over the disappointment and reached out to you. Maybe. Yeah, and she's also passed a lot of, a lot of legislation. Yeah. You know, um, and so, yeah, we, we're not going to agree on everything. Will we bump heads? Probably. Will we you know, have have arguments, so we probably will, you know, but the fact that she did actually, um, the fact that she did actually reach out um, and we got to, we got to have that real conversation because the only way you're going to know about about me is if you sit down and truly talk to me um, and I can tell you everything you need to know. Well, I think King is about to take over this podcast, so I think we're going to cut this short now, but we definitely want to have you back on after you're inaugurated and talk more about policy. Absolutely. We really appreciate you coming. You, you're you going on vacation or going out of town soon? I'm not going to... Tomorrow, yeah, yeah, tomorrow. And I'm cutting my phone off. You should. <laughs> Smart man. I, yeah. I, I can say that 
few people have deserved a vacation more than our guest right here. So for, for all of our stories, stlpublicradio.org. Follow me on Twitter at Jay Rosenbaum. Follow Joe on Twitter at... Jay Manis. That's J-M-A-N-N-I-E-S. Follow Rachel on Twitter at... R. Lipman. Two P's, two N's. Follow our guest, Bruce Franks, on Twitter at... Bruce Franks Jr. That's Bruce Franks J-R. Joy. <laughs> How would, uh, does, does King Franks have a, a Twitter uh, account? He's right? gonna have yeah. one soon. He takes over my Facebook page. He, oh my gosh. When you put a picture of King, we got a picture that we put up, and it has nine hundred and sixty <laughs> likes. And so, well, um, he's trying to take over his host of this <laughs> podcast right now too. Well, um, I think I have some stiff competition, but until next yeah, time, yeah. so long. <laughs> All right. I never change up, change up. Sh- shout out to my day one. I bout to never change up. Hey. I bout to never change up. Riding through my city, feeling something like the mayor. Got your girl chosen cause she said I'm getting paper. Bad yellow bone, blow a purple like a Laker. The Gateway brings you the day's news from the St. Louis region and across Missouri. It also includes stories from the Illinois side of the river and our Metro East reporter, Will Bauer. In Alton, in Belleville, in East St. Louis, in Edwardsville, in Cahokia Heights, at Scott Air Force Base, I'm Will Bauer, St. Louis Public Radio. Listen to reports from Will and all of our journalists weekdays on The Gateway, on the STLPR app, and wherever you get podcasts.